Hey there. Now, a few days back, Chris Camillo posted a fascinating thread on X. He was talking about the ludicrous potential of uh, Tesla's humanoid robot, Optimus. And uh, he was talking about how it could really transform the global economy here on Earth. But there was one part of that thread where he speaks about what is potentially an even bigger opportunity for Optimus, and that is for Optimus in uh, space amongst the stars. And um, I have to tell you, I completely agree with um, what Chris said there in that thread um, here on the Over the Horizon podcast. We've been talking a lot about Optimus's potential in space. Um, I've had the pleasure of talking about this with Dr. Scott Walter, uh, who's a mechanical and aerospace engineer, two-time founder uh, of industrial robot companies. He's joining me again today. It's a pleasure to have him. I also have with me, for the first time, Ozan Belik. He's um, a software engineer and a self-professed aerospace Greek. So welcome, Dr. Scott Walter. And uh, Ozan Bey, merhaba. It's great to yeah. have uh, both of you here. Um, and, and, and the same. It's it's great to see Ozan yeah. again. We've, uh, we're have we pretty good ex-buddies going back and forth. And I think we've been on at least one, one video together before. Basically, I have crazy ideas. And then Ozan's able to go through and tell me, because he, he's able to run the numbers. He's much better at running the numbers than I am. I just have like a gut feel. And he's able to tell me whether my gut's going the right way or not. So it's really great to have Ozan here. Yeah. Well, it's great to be here. You both. We we welcome crazy ideas here on Over the Horizon. We live in crazy times, and you never know what's going to come through. These are times uh, that ordinarily, otherwise, should look like science fiction. But here we are. All right. So let me just um, pull up this. Uh, this is the tweet um, from the thread by Chris, where he talks about Tesla's Optimus division having the potential to hit a ten trillion valuation. Um, he also talks about sending Optimus beyond Earth, uh, intergalactic humanoids, mining asteroids, and setting up space habitats and whatnot. And we really are in these very interesting times where there's been so much of uh, development in space launches, in robotics, in AI, embodied AI, that I think it's time to just revisit this topic and do a little deeper dive into um, where we stand and where we're headed. So let me begin with you, Scott. What do you make of um, of this tweet and this thread? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense because we've already been sending robotic explorers out into space for the longest time because they're able to go places that, that we can't. And part of it is because they're able to deal with very harsh environments. But of course, they've been very limited in the capability because um, they have a certain amount of onboard intelligence, but not artificial intelligence. So they're, they're running a lot of set pieces and what they're supposed to do. And whenever something goes wrong, there's that long communication delay, but then the engineers figure out some sort of clever hack or fix and they get in there and get to move along. So we know these machines can operate. However, they don't have the humanoid form. So we know they're just, they're kind of limited in what they're able to do. But the proof of concept is there that we can send these vehicles into a very harsh environment. And we'll talk about what that harsh environment is like and what some of the yeah. challenges are to go through. Yeah, yeah. Was that? Did yeah, I mean, when, I, when I first, uh, I totally agree with Scott. And, and when I first saw that tweet, what jumped out at me was- uh, uh, Let me just yeah, pull it up. That, that was, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. That, that was kind of like, well, did he, did he really just come out and say that? But of course, with all these things, it's, you know, if you, if you look far enough into the future, um, these numbers that seem crazy, uh, you can make sense of them. And, yeah, and, uh, 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 I'll throw a crazy number out there for you. It was on three trillion. Why is yeah. that number crazy? Tell me, Scott. Microsoft just hit that market cap the other day. There you go. So we're <laughs> yep. only talking about a factor of three in the future. Okay. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so and and they're not the only trillion dollar company. You know, they they surpassed Apple, and Apple is like two point something. So we know you can have company valuations like that. So in some ways, that's not nutty. Um, hmm. However. Because the number does seem kind of crazy, Chris admitted in uh, in the Spaces uh, podcast that um, 
he scaled it back because he didn't think anyone would believe him if he said the real number was like 20 trillion or 50 trillion or something like that. I mean, so uh, he, 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 you, he can, you to, can go even higher than that, right? Like if you, if you easily. have eight, you know, if we're talking about 8 billion robots, you know, as many robots mm -hmm. as the 8 billion people on earth, and each of them is pulling, you know, three to five shifts. Yeah. Um, what's the, what's the real value of that? And why, why limit to limit it to 8 billion? I mean, if we're talking about, solar scale or galactic scale um of course at that point it, yeah. they would look like optimus robots but I, I i have two cell, cell phones right here right and like yeah, another yeah. one somewhere else and like some of my family you know everyone in my family has one maybe two so yeah the number of potential cell phones is not the population <laughs> it's more it's a good thing saying about the bots like you say it's like right. well yeah one for home use one for tutoring the kids and then you know some others that maybe do the gardening and then also yeah. they need to to produce stuff for us. So we all have like a part of a bot that's in a factory somewhere. So yeah, you, you could easily see it could be more yeah. than the human population. Hang on. I Do you think the value of a bot on Earth is going to be the same as the value of that same bot or a similar bot in space? That's a good, good question. I think even the value of the bot on Earth is going to drop below the value of the, of the human that it replaces. But, you know, what what rate that happens at um that's kind of hard to predict right mm. right and and again when we start talking in the future about these dollars it, it's hard to say if we're talking about monopoly dollars at that point because mm -hmm. it, once you start get this age of yeah. abundance there's a good chance there's going to be rapid deflation so you know mm -hmm. it's it, in, in some ways because the bots are making well below minimum wage for the the effective um products there is like everything's going to start coming down and that's why it's really hard to say. It's like, is it really going to be a ten trillion dollar valuation? Because money may have a very different kind of value going forward. But yeah. I definitely agree that you know, right now the bots have an intrinsic value, which is probably going to be way more than the cost to actually build them, because yeah. they they should be simple enough to do. But they're going to be worth almost ten times what that is to begin with, because there are people that will be willing to pay a hundred thousand dollars per year to have one of these bots. So you can already look at it like that. And then, you know, over several years, that, that means these bots have almost an intrinsic value of over half a million dollars or more, that that's mm -hmm. the revenue stream that the bot maker can get just from one of those things. But as you start to get a wider displacement and then people are able to afford it, because there's lots of products we have now, you could not afford 20, 30 years ago, you know, only big corporations had the money and then the, the price came down and then everyone started getting in there. So I agree, it's like, no one's going to have this space to themselves because when you see a pie that's that big, is everyone going to be sitting on the sideline? No. They're like, oh, yeah, Tesla going to have the entire pie. No. It's, there's going to be competition coming in that's going to drive it down. So it's really hard to say what the value is. And, and I, I think all we can do, and I agree with Ozon, is it's like, yeah, it'll probably be less. But its value in space may be something completely different because it may unlock a potential that we can't unlock as humans. So suddenly it's worth less than a human on Earth. But in space, it may have a much higher value than a person. So, so think about this. Okay, just how many billions went to over time went into the Apollo project, right? And, to, and, and that program has is for all means and purposes. It's it's representative of our biggest achievement uh, as a race uh, in our ambitions to be a space where a race, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so much of that was concentrated on the human. Um, the human form, astronauts, keeping them safe, the spacesuits, the technology yeah. to take them there. So much of that would really not be required for a bot that wouldn't breathe Absolutely. oxygen. It, it could, you know, it could withstand far greater range of uh, extreme temperatures and radiation in these austere environments that any human possibly could. And you could just teleoperate it to begin with. You could start off with uh, Optimus uh, Gen 2. Or Gen three, what's stopping you from doing that? What do you think, Doctor Walter? Uh, it's going to be a question of the the environment they're going in, and that, uh, well, in some ways, there's some things about the space environment that are easier to deal with than on Earth. There are a lot of things that are far more difficult. So, um, in some ways, you could almost say operating in a vacuum might be easier than having to work in an atmosphere that can have like a lot of moisture and you know dust and all, all these other things so i'll talk about it you know pure vacuum here but then of course once you get down to the surface of the moon 
you have dust, which is probably worse than any dust that you have here on earth, because it's just yeah. really gritty and really sharp because there hasn't been enough yeah. erosion to take the, the rough edges off. Um, so it's like, oh, okay, we don't have to worry about the oxygen causing things to corrode. We don't have to worry about moisture getting in and stuff like that. That makes mm -hmm. it easier. Um, but yeah. <laughs> there's going to be this other host of things. And we have this extreme temperature environment where it's both too hot and too cold all at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and and then thinking about what your power source is going to be like. So, you know, the, the Optimus would definitely have to have some changes to it. And of course, the other thing we don't know is, is what you'd have to do for the radiation hardening of all the electronics. So so that's mm. probably also going to have to be, be upgraded. Yeah. Um, so you're going to have a lot of seals that are going to have to keep this dust out and some ways of cleaning it. But we know all the things we've sent out there have been able to function and function yeah. Yeah. way beyond their sell-by date. So if mm. you remember the first Pathfinder, I think was just like a 90 day mission and it ended up being several years. Uh, yeah. Even the um, um, Inspiration uh, mission with uh, the helicopter, the quad, the, uh, yeah, the, the helicopter that, you know, last week just finally had what it's 72nd and last 72nd, flight. Yeah. Yeah. But it was only supposed to, I think it had like two or five. three. Yeah. Or, maximum or five, five total. I, I mean, the thing is what they were yeah. hoping and it was only yeah. going to last like yeah. maybe a, a, a couple of months at, at most. Yeah. So we, we see even in the harsh environment, we can design these things that they can have a pretty long service life. Uh, the thing is, a lot of the times we could extend that service life if we have someone else, you know, just kind of go out there and, and just tap something here and there or just like give a little bit of lifter. <laughs> you know, a lot of times when things get stuck around Close here, you just right elbow there. the thing or tap it with it. And that's like all it takes sometimes to get it unstuck. And so, uh, and then, you know, other things that might require a little bit more. So if, if you have these bots that can help the service, the equipment that's out there, that's already a huge benefit. To say nothing yeah. about like the number of bots we can send to yeah. Mars or the moon versus the number of astronauts. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of tapping things here and there, uh, I, I, I bet NASA Mars scientists were hoping, um, well, well, they would have given an arm and a leg to have an Optimus on Mars to fix uh, the Perseverance rover that was stuck with a couple of pebbles in its mechanism, its sample retrieval mechanism. And just think about that. Stuck for about six or seven months because of a couple of pebbles. It's a bit ridiculous. And, and then also the solar panels, you know, it's like, you know, we yeah. remember all those scenes with Dust. Mark Watney and the, um, and, the, yeah. and the Martian just going out there and then, you know, blowing it off. Uh, just because the, the dust can end up reducing what is your only way of being able to produce energy uh, yeah. in these places. So you need to have effective solar panels. Uh, and then the, the batteries is going to be a trick, but we'll we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right. It's it's um, it's interesting. You you spoke about um, the lunar dust, and I was speaking to Dr. Shauna Pandya a couple of weeks back, uh, and we were talking about the future of human. Uh, civilization in space. Uh, she's a space medicine um, doctor. She's an aquanaut and an austere environments researcher. And she had something very interesting to, talk, to say about um, the future potential of AI, of embodied AI and robotics, um, and, and what sort of a role it has to play in the evolution of our space program. Take a listen. Sending humans to one of the most envi austere environments that humanity has ever known. And so um, we need to ask ourselves, how do we not just survive, but thrive on that environment through technology when it comes to uh, communication, when it comes to operations, when it comes to decision making. And I think as machine learning and AI gets better uh, and more reliable and um, less um, error prone, uh, AI will be critical for monitoring, detection, uh, decision making, um, as well as uh, early warnings um, as to the health of our infrastructure, the health of our astronauts, um, the overall uh, probability of mission uh, success, um, and also offering useful interventions. So there is definitely, um, this it really is, the past year and the past two years have been incredibly fruitful for AI with ChatGPT, um, with the rise of AI, with its applications for, for medicine, for for science, for engineering, um, for for the internet age. So um, to be determined where we end up, but there's a lot of promise right now. Yeah, I mean, this this was recorded a, a few weeks back and this was before 
Uh, we've seen Figure come out with Figure One, and before the Tesla earnings call, where Elon spoke about the potential of having an update uh, for Optimus every few months. Um, so it, it's, I mean, the case is there to be made. Uh, it's acknowledged by by scientists and researchers across uh, across domains and fields. Would you say Optimus is ready as of now? How close is Optimus? If we just want to, look, if if Elon just shoots one to the moon uh, on a starship like he did, uh, well, if if he could put his roadster up there, <laughs> he could just send one to the moon. Let's say in a in the first starship, uh, you'd have to have a trial launch to see if how it uh, you know reaches the moon. Just send an Optimus along with it. Do you think the present form would be enough? It would be able to to probably operate there. It just wouldn't be the optimal version of Optimus. Uh, yeah, so sure. you, you may get, I don't know, a couple hours, a couple of days, maybe you're like a couple of weeks out of it. But my biggest concern is the, you know, the batteries and how they're going to kind of deal in that very cold environment that's going to be there. You also need to make sure that you're able to, to charge it back up. So there's always going to be a problem, but it's a, so in like it's in its form. That's why I said, we're going to talk about the batteries. Because the, the battery problem has been solved because we've been putting these rovers on planets throughout the, the solar system and they're able to function, but they're not your run of the mill kind of battery. There are special batteries that are able to do that. So, you know, the Voyager probes uh, and, and many others where they have to have battery backup or even what's going on in, uh, in Leo, um, yeah. you're, charging, you're constantly having this charging, discharging cycle. So you, you have special space-based batteries for doing it. I believe what they are is they're known as uh, hydrogen nickel batteries. So they're they're kind of a cross between um, a, a um, it's a, a fuel cell, a hydrogen fuel cell, and a battery. So you, you're doing something like that in which the, the the fuel source is literally hydrogen gas, and so you've got to have it under high pressure to be able to do it. And uh, it does have a it's it's kind of like a, a hydrogen nitride, but works along these different temperature extremes has pretty good energy density it's just that it's kind of very very expensive so it's not something you would do every day it could so, be possible Scott, can, can i ask you a question it. there yes uh do you know if that's what starlink uses i'm not sure whether they're using that or not i know nasa does but starlink yeah. maybe not because they and that's that's would be interesting to find out is because they have to do that they're in shadow all the time and yeah. they're they're not using like a radio isotope generator or anything like that when they're dark. Yeah. So the whole idea is they charge and discharge. So I had to find out whether it's a special type of, of lithium ion that's able to, to deal with it or because of the short periods that you're in the darkness, maybe you're able to do the thermal management a little bit better. Whereas, you know, when it's like you're in deep space, it's like, whoop, <laughs> we, we got to have to deal yeah. with, with that constantly. I, you know, I, I have run some numbers on, on, on this kind of stuff and, if, uh, you know, two, two issues, right? One of them is the uh, number of cycles mm -hmm. uh, in, in Leo, which, uh, you know, if you just pack extra batteries, you know, 2000 cycle life batteries will do fine. Um, you know, if you if you pack extra extra capacity so that it's not discharging fully on each. Right, uh, right. Each yes. Month. And the other, as you mentioned, is perhaps the bigger issue is the thermal management, uh, which basically just comes down to uh, if you insulate the batteries and have a local heat source, which could just basically be, you know, resistive charge going out of the batteries. Or just the battery itself sometimes. Yeah, it, generates itself, yeah. Yeah. It, it does. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can have a little resistive circuit to supplement that as needed. So you can have, you know, active uh, temperature control and keep it at earth. Uh, yeah, and they could also be like reptiles. I mean, they could just, you know, bask themselves in the sun when they're on that side of the orbit. Right. So you're like 45 yeah. minutes in, 45 minutes out. So that's not too bad. Yeah. I mean, you do need a little bit more thermal mass uh, mm -hmm. if you want to spend 45 minutes in the shade and 45 minutes. And then, you know, what would be ideal for at least a flat back arrangement? Um, but yeah, if you have that bit of insulation, that can that can really make it fairly easy to regulate that temperature. And that I think that would go for Optimus as well, as long as right. it can handle the, um, so I mean, these batteries are packed at one bar uh, Earth uh, atmosphere. Like I, I don't know how flexible the material is and like whether you would have, or like how strong the casing is. Um, so, you know, if you did put it in a zero bar uh, vacuum environment, is it gonna try to expand and pop open, right? 
Um, that would be a potential concern with cells, but um, if you can prevent that, then I think that a little bit of insulation sure, sure. might and, be all that Optimus so, needs. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and you're right problem. about the, 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 the way you set up the pack is you really only have maybe about 60% of the battery that's that's usable. You, you want to stay away from going beyond charging over 80 and going under 20%. There's another reason you want to go in there is that you can charge really quickly between 20% and 80%. And after that, it tails off. And sure. if you only got 45 minutes in the sun, you're just not going to have enough time to get from 80 to 100%. And, the, and then you could say, well, why not go with something that a battery that doesn't degrade like um, uh, an LFP battery? So uh, that would be like a lithium uh, iron uh, phosphate battery because they're really good at being able to do a lot of cycles and going from zero to 100. Well, it's because you get the same problem with the charging curve at 80%. So it's a little bit heavier. So you could say, oh, okay, but what we do is we make sure it has the same kind of uh, energy volume in there for the same mass, but you effectively are also down at 60% because where the charge curves have to be. So it could be that they're doing it uh, with something like that. And the whole idea is, is Starlink, what's the cost of each satellite? I think it's like around a quarter million. It, it may have changed. I think the original ones are around a quarter million. They probably cost a bit more now because it's a little bit bigger, but at the same time, they've probably been driving the cost down because they've been able to figure out what they're manufacturing. So the idea is to be cheap. And what is the service life? Is it maximum five years or was it less than that? So I think the target is five years. They, yeah. they might, I mean, some of them have obviously uh, been decommissioned before that, but I think most yeah. of them are still going. And that's so, so they think of that they, service they, they life. Some of them might run longer, but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think but it, I, you know, it could be. You know, either your batteries are degrading and you're going to do it. And again, you know, the whole idea of batteries degrading, oh, they go from, you know, only be able to hold 80% of the charge. It's not like they completely go dead. Um, right. So they, there's still something in there. The real thing it comes down to the amount of usable propellant. And once you get below some threshold, it's like, that's it. You've got to burn up because space junk. Let me let me ask, ask a silly question here. How much of the technology that exists can be repurposed? Do we need to reinvent the wheel? when it comes to Optimus or CAN technologies that have worked for human astronauts also be applied, whether it's something like spacesuits. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you I don't just put Optimus in a space are, suit. Are, are, are a very bad solution to the problem. <laughs> I mean, it's, like, it's the best thing that we have for humans, but I mean, even for humans, that is actually an area where, where we want major innovation. If we want something right. that's, that's functional, that's, that's safe and reliable and and easy to work in. Uh, really, the dream has has long been mechanical counterpressure suits and, and stuff like that. You know, you, being in this bubble of gas is just not a a great long term solution. Uh, and it would be, I think it would be, it would be funny to put an, uh, put Optimus in one of those. But you know, the mobility issues that it already has, I feel like it would just mm -hmm. make <laughs> Make it worse, yeah. yeah the, uh, the, the, the the real thing is just protecting sort of the jointed areas from the dust. I think, you know, everything else you don't have to. So you try to seal it up. So there's going to be some kind of covers in there, and you know if if you need to, you could just put a pair of overalls on it or something like that. Just not pressurize it. That yeah. that could be the work. The you know one maybe maybe that's almost the yeah, best solution. In some ways. Skin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With with very low resistance because again. The astronauts get exhausted because just to move their arm, they're fighting the the, the fact that the suit just wants to do whoop, this to them, right? You know, so whoop, they're going to be out there like that, and then they have to fight that constantly. So, um, yeah, they they said it's it's almost like running a marathon uh, after yeah. every single one of those EVAs, which was a couple of hours. Yeah. They said it was it was equivalent to that. Yeah, yeah, and also the way the backpack was designed was very high up, so. One of the problems that the Apollo astronauts had was constantly having to fight um, against tipping over. Yes, uh, and the joints and all of that. It was uh, so. Of course, these the we're we're supposed to be at the golden age of space suit development. You know, SpaceX is working on an EVA suit for I think it was Polaris mission. Um, there are applications there. I think there are learnings to be taken from there, and um, perhaps. I don't know, maybe uh, adopted it when it comes to Optimus. Yeah, I mean, I think the MMOT protection layer could, could definitely be mm. applied. Maybe some of the thermal management techniques. Uh, mm. I think that... Just put a uh, heat pump on it. Yeah, yeah. so so I think that um, the Polaris suits are using 
uh, I think they said they use, they're using liquid oxygen for cooling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is, again, not an optimal solution for something that's going to be out there working for, for weeks and months. There's a lot of mass that you're basically venting. Hmm. Um, but again, you're, you're operating in a very different environment to Earth orbit. Uh, uh, near the lunar uh, poles, you've got uh, a, a much less uh, IR from the surface. It's, it's, it's a cold surface and you, uh, you have, um, yeah, I mean, you don't really have reduced solar exposure, but uh, that IR really changes things. If you have a reflective uh, coat, like you can, you can basically passively uh, manage your temperature. And, and of course, Optimus can handle a wider range than a human. Um, so you, it's really about protecting that battery and keeping it in, in, in the right temperature zone. So insulate it mm. and add a, add a resistive circuit to make sure it's warm enough when it, when it gets cold, when it's in shadow. And then it, it's, yeah, and basically it basically protect the joints, as Scott said. And, right. Yeah. Uh, and and, the, the, and the, the joint thermal management will be interesting. So you have, probably have to make sure you pick your alloys just right. Cause you can imagine it yeah, you've got one overheat. of these, these these joints that one of them like overheats or you know gets hot or cold suddenly it binds up so uh, those will be a few things you have to be careful of you have to be careful what lubricants you use <laughs> because you don't want a lubricant that suddenly solidifies it i think there was a spacecraft uh, back you know 40 50 years ago where that was like an issue <laughs> it turned out it was like well yeah. these oil-based lubricants aren't necessarily a good idea the um some of the I other mean, things if you, you, if you just use teflon coating and avoid uh, yeah exactly no, exactly no. which is why i think those coatings were kind of developed almost for the space program mm -hmm. because of, of issues like that uh making right. sure that would work a, you know as far as the optimus thermal management currently we believe it's it's probably just using uh forced air uh going through yeah. there may not be liquid cooling because it doesn't need it while it's operating it's it's maximum is about 500 watts so it probably would be okay air cooled the real reason that you might need to have liquid cooling is for your recharge cycle because that's when your battery management system and you know, everything gets kind of hot and you need to do that yeah. that might be some external thing that you have that when you plug in you know you run your coolant loop to that rather than have on there however i think um, a few years ago james dama had done some sort of calculation you know thinking about what the thermal management is going to be like in a vacuum with optimus and he thought they, you might have to have some sort of veins on there as well so you might have a a liquid system where you basically have what looks like these wings yeah. which is just going to be for radiative cooling um, Dude, that's like transformers. <laughs> yeah, in a way, in a way. So, so it's possible you might look at that. I, I'm not 100 percent sure that because it seems like if it's only running at 500 watts, it should be able to dissipate that energy pretty well. Uh, yeah. But I defer to James that he's gone ahead and, and done some sort of calculation, thinking that there just wouldn't be enough. So Optimus I mean, prime. if if yeah. all you know, if you have 500 watts just in the battery pack, I think that that could be a problem. But if it's kind of spread out it's, through, it's distributed, yeah, and, and that's it's maximum. It's distributed, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. So I you get about that's... 75 watts in the FSD. So yeah. that's going to be right at the torso. You've got the batteries there; they're going to be producing a little bit of heat, and then you've got like you know, the shoulder joints going to be producing some, and these other extremities going to be. But that's 500 probably when it's walking. Other times yeah. it's maybe 200, 300. And then on the lunar surface, it may be a lot less because you're not toting around as much mass. Right. So, I mean, that's that's about, you know, at room temperature, you basically need about two square meters of surface mm -hmm. area, which is about what a human has. So if it was distributed all over, there'd be you, you could keep it at room temperature at uh, mm -hmm. without adding veins. But um, I would also say that, I mean, the nice thing about uh, radiative cooling is that it, it's proportional to the fourth power of temperature. So you got, you know, we're talking about cooling at 300 Kelvin, but if you bump that up a little bit, then you need, uh, like the, the parts of the, of the uh, of Optimus that are not the battery can likely tolerate much higher temperatures. So, you know, even if it's running at 400, 450 Kelvin in, uh, in the joints or, and, and you know that that will also dissipate some like that that increase in temperature in the joints will also uh, uh, you'll have this linear um, relationship of how how well it, it dissipates the rest of the uh, of the skin. So you could, I would be surprised if you needed veins mm -hmm. for a regular operation and yeah. for for charging, um, if you just charge slower. 
Yeah, you either charge slower or wherever you're doing the charging, that unit deals with it. Yeah, yeah. It because with it. again, yeah. it could circulate the coolant through you and then it figures out how to dump the heat energy. And it could be as simple as it does it. Oh, so it wouldn't be called geothermal, it'd be um, moon thermal or whatever, lunathermal, where you just dump it into the into the, the regolith, which is already pretty cold. So you've got a nice right. <clears throat> heat reservoir, or let's say uh, lack of heat reservoir that you can dump energy into. So there, yeah. there are situations like that, that definitely. So I, I see as like the, the recharging infrastructure as being something that should be completely separate from the bot. The only part of the charging infrastructure for the bot is the port that it plugs into and that's it. All the other electronics, everything else would be somewhere else. Unless, you know, you want these veins that it's walking around with to actually be solar panels. Yeah. And didn't Blue Origin, don't they have something kind of like that also? Do they? I don't know. Well, on, on the, the lander, they're, they're talking, remember, they, they were showing the solar oh, panels yeah. on there and also some way being able to dissipate, um, to, to radiate away heat because of the, um, yeah, they want to use hydrogen. And the problem with hydrogen is boil off. So they yeah. constantly have to do something to chill it. And so, yeah, they, they've got like something, and it looked like you might almost be able to sometimes combine the two systems together yeah. that you, you might, Put a panel up that's pointing towards the sun, so it's like picking up all this radiation. The, the problem with solar panels is they like to be cool, yes. uh, and when they get hot, they don't perform so well. So you you might do something like on that, where you've got a cooling loop on the other side, or you you, right. you could imagine a bunch of different ways, and so you have a radiator that's dumping everything off on the other end. So yeah, yeah, you you never know. So, you can come up with some clever solutions. I've actually done done some math on that as well for Starship when we when the first renders came out and it was like where are the radiators uh, and I was, we were trying to figure out you know where could could they be situated and that was one of the options that I had considered is like can you put them on the on the solar panels now in the case of Starship they didn't have the the wings initially uh, so it was it was kind of can you can you use the shaded panels uh, can you use the, the panels that are exposed as as like a single layer uh, radiative surface? And it's it's possible to make that all work out. Um, one problem, especially when you're trying to cool liquid hydrogen, is you, you're trying to pump uh, all that heat. And uh, of course, as you all well know, the higher that that temperature difference or the temperature multiple from your cold side to the to the hot side, the a the less efficient uh, you're cooling, and b the 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 greater the power multiple that you need in order to drive and you know, pump that heat. Um, so you, for uh, cryogenics, especially you, it's, it's best to have radiators that are as cold as you can manage uh, that to really drive down those power requirements. Uh, and, and on like near the lunar uh, poles, you do have that option of going down to radiators that are in the hundred to 200 Kelvin range. If you just keep that, completely shaded from the sun. Um, so I don't know what Blue Origin is planning there, but uh, uh, it, 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 almost, it would be a surprising design decision. But then again, it, there are a lot of surprising design decisions. It, it almost makes me wonder whether, you know, you do come up with something that is, is akin to a geothermal system. Uh, you know, that's going to require a certain amount of infrastructure, but do, do you start drilling into the lunar regolith around there and then you just kind of tie that into wherever your vehicles are that are coming down. So that's assuming they're always kind of landing in the same area. If you're going off somewhere else, you know, literally kind of off grid, if you want to think it that way. Uh, yeah, then you have to bring everything on your own. But within a certain area, yeah, why not? Um, yeah, the, the lunar surface is pretty cold. So if you need something for collisions that, that would work maybe just as well. It, it is kind of ironic that... Do you want to use like conductive cooling like that? Is that better to cool than the inky black of space, which is three degrees Kelvin, which, you know, is like almost yeah. ideal for radiative. So I always say, wait a minute, what's the problem? It's like my pond freezes uh, in the wintertime, even though the outdoor temperature will be several degrees above the freezing point because yeah. the clear sky and everything like that. Right. So, but and that's how I was always surprised. Like, oh, it's so hard to get rid of waste heat in space. I'm like, oh, okay. So... If that's the case, then we have what is effectively a pretty cold ice cube right at our feet, both on Mars and on the yeah. moon. Yeah, the one one downside of lunar regolith when it comes to cooling that way is that it's, uh, I think, probably because of the lack of water content it's uh, and, and the fluffiness of it, mm -hmm. it's a yeah. pretty good insulator. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. So you just don't have that. Yeah. Like yeah. You would need veins in the, in the ground probably. It, to exactly. Get exactly. In some ways that that's why geothermal works pretty well because you have all that groundwater that's kind of helping to move the, the temperature around. But I mean, the other way to look at it is that um, when we start building these infrastructures, I don't think you're going to be wanting to dump the waste heat out into space. You're going to be wanting to dump it into your habitats because you're, you're going to have this perpetual energy crisis, both on the moon and on Mars. Right. And so wherever, if you've got something that's generating waste heat, that's going to be dumped because you need cooling somewhere else. There are going to be plenty of places that are going to pick it up. Plus I think you'll have, you know, thermal mass of the different regolith. It may be, it, it should be able to soak that up as well. So I, I would think, that would be the logical place to put it is store it for when you need it or don't worry about the fact you get some excess heat because there's no such thing as excess heat when you're out there yeah I mean, if you reduce the insulation on your habs then you just have a exactly have a oh yeah that's the other way yeah but i don't think anyone's going to reduce the insulation it's like still just in case the tech breaks down i want to make sure insulation is working <laughs> yeah so so then in that case the problem with the halves is that if you have the insulation, then then the human generated heat, heat. is enough to really okay. That you, yeah, you still need to cool it. Like okay, if you okay. Have, so if you, have if you have good insulation, yeah. then you still yeah. need to. Now, now, if 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 Ozon, uh, if you think Ozon is crazy on on that point, I had actually learned this from like one of the superintendents of my school district, because there was a question about, well, you know what. Uh, why do they only have like a, sh a short holiday in February? Why isn't like a full week or something like that? And he said, right. well, part of it is because in February, it's really cold. And whether the students are there or not, they have to warm the buildings to like 55 degrees. And when the students right. are there, it naturally goes up because they, they basically yeah. have these little heaters that are running at 98.6 degrees running around the whole day that <laughs> actually warm the building up enough that the amount of, of heating they need to do for 55 degrees when no one's there versus yeah. 70 degrees when it is there, it's like the same energy bill. So yeah, yeah you are dumping an energy awful efficiency. Lot of heat. Yes, especially if things are, are well insulated. Wow. All right. That was uh sorry, we, we went, went off down. the there, right? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> we I was fascinating because we went down right down to the warren on that. And that was great to 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 understand and to get a sense of. But I'm just do you think there's an option? Before we could look at Optimus on the moon, do you think we could look at a possibility of Optimus on the ISS or another international space station? I mean, you have the Astro B that's been, um, these are these cuboidal little robots that have been uh, assisting astronauts on board the ISS for a few years now. They've been hugely successful. Um, is there, do you think there's a case for Optimus to be tried out first on board the ISS? Optimus is designed to work in uh, gravitational space. Uh, not in zero G. So you wouldn't need the legs because it, if you look at the B, it gets around really easily just with these little fans. It's really kind of amazing and how well it's able to control itself because it doesn't have to worry about gravity. Uh, now having arms would be nice, but you might want to have more spindly arms because the Optimus arms are probably overpowered for almost everything you'd want to do. Where Optimus would make more sense is probably not inside the ISS, but outside the ISS, maybe to do some of the EVAs and you might design it a little bit differently to be able to move around in that environment. Um, right. And of course, there are already bots that are that are doing it that are kind of look like a centipede, but you know they're a traditional, much larger arm. And in many cases, those arms are just there to position the astronaut to where mm. <laughs> the astronaut needs yeah, to be yeah. to be able to perform something. So um, I think you would see something, but sans legs. There's almost no reason for the bot to have legs uh, in space. I think it would be really cool to have a version of Optimus that has four four arms instead of two arms and two legs. Mm -hmm. And I would just rip that. <laughs> you know, yeah, kind of a Doc Ock. Yeah. <laughs> I was just yeah. about to say that. Yeah. Because, you know, ideally, you, you know, if you want to really get leverage, you kind of want more than one arm grabbing your, yeah. your base. And, and you want to move along these handholds. And then you also can have, you know, one to three arms free for uh manipulating things and that's yeah man yeah yeah you, but also yeah, in terms of like the arms, arms uh, I think. Often wish that they had more arms that they could use yeah yeah when they're going on those space ones yeah so so but, probably but, th yeah. three would be an interesting configuration you know the, the question is do you need four there'll probably be the arguments back and forth just like when they were designing the optimus hand the yeah. question is do we really need five fingers and you know it's like most people say three fingers is like really all that you need 
but they decided for, and even um, the CEO of Figure, I kind of asked him if he was able to drop some joint, what it be? He said, uh, the pinky, because it seemed like they had a big argument and were like, do we really need the pinky? So when it comes to arms, um, you definitely need two arms. The question is whether the third arm is like all you need to be able to grapple and move yourself around. Yeah. But it might come I mean, in handy to have a second one if you both hands are busy and like, okay, how do I go from one to the next? Right. And, the, and then you have the, I mean, you have that, that whole question of, of the movement and, and, and bracing yourself and all that. But then there's also the, you can always use more arms for the work that you're doing because there's often, you know, if you just... I mean, we often run into that situation when we're doing work on Earth, right? Of wishing that we had another, an extra pair of hands, because uh, you you often have a work piece, and then you have another piece that you're trying to join to it, to it, and then you have one or more tools that you're trying to hold, or you're trying Which to are effectively to get, your third and fourth arm, the vice grip, and everything else. That's what that is, right? right? <laughs> yeah. So imagine if you know you had that option of the extra arm to. Yeah. So it, things. yeah, and and that again, that comes down to a lot of people thinking the whole thing through, and. Okay. NASA has been very good at that because when you look at the Apollo spacecraft and everything, you know, I, I was sort of looking when the, the rover was going through and some of the elements on there and, you know, them realizing, oh, we need to have an eye shade here and everything else because they thought the whole process through. It was like, well, where's the sun going to come in? If we need to look in the eyepiece, there's going to be a lot of glare. You know, every, every little detail was already thought about on Earth. And, of course, with a lot of simulation and training, they discovered, hey, it's a little bit hard for me to do this. We need to modify it. Because you want to make sure before you get up there, you've got every component that you need. You don't want to have more than you need, and you definitely don't want to have less. Oh, I'm sorry. Speaking of number of arms, before we jump to another topic, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Project Hail Mary, uh, Andy Weir's uh, book. And uh, for those who have read it, you know, Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> Five arms. Five arms. Okay. So that's, that's, that's an interesting creature. Yeah. Do we have any, are there any examples? I thought for anything, are there any examples in nature of a five arm? I, I think, I don't uh, think there are. Starfish, starfish, well, starfish, starfish, I guess, right? Yeah. Starfish, starfish yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. it's an alien, but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the five arms are handy. <laughs> they sure do. I can't help but wonder. I mean, um, there is a safety case to be made to, um, to deploy Optimus for extravehicular activities um, outside the ISS. I mean, do you remember the case of the astronaut losing a what it was a tool toolkit or a tool in space mm -hmm. recently, a few weeks back? Um, I mean, oh, just God forbid you lose an astronaut. I mean, oh, yeah. fine. You just, I mean, if you lose if you lose a bot, it's just another object in space. You know, um, I think there's a there's a case to be made at least um, to begin with for Optimus uh, in some form or the other for some limited yes. use for, for, for the for safety. I I, I think it's about time. NASA has been working for a number of years on coming up with these kind of astronaut robots. And more than, you know, what we see, like the big Canadian armors going around, they, they really haven't done that. And I'm not sure why not, because it would make a lot of sense to be able to do something. Absolutely. Um, the, the astronauts, I mean, the, the prep time they have to go through just to be able to get out. So if they yeah. need to get out there immediately, you have to wait a long time. Uh, the fact that you're like you're using some consumables and everything like that because you're going to evacuate that. So who, who knows whether they're yeah. they're you know that oxygen get, whether it gets vented out or not. The um, and then you know what the suits in, in have the to limits do. to to um, how much how yeah. long they can be out there. You know sometimes yeah they, there, there's limits. They, they run into these hard limits and they have to come back before the work is done and then it's just, yeah like, yeah to, so there, there's there's a lot of that. Whereas yeah and it's it's very very costly to put an astronaut out there for an EVA. And doing it with the bot, and especially if the bot could be, you know, there, we're not worrying about any lag. So telerobotic would be very easy. You could probably even control it telerobotically from ground. Uh, there wouldn't be that much lag. And a little bit of telerobotic could even be possible in the moon because it wouldn't be that bad a lag. And we already are doing, let's say, um, t telerobotic operation within the solar system. If you look at a lot of the rovers that were sent out there, which are effectively a, a type of robot, um, at first they didn't really have much autonomy. It was, okay, we're gonna study the landscape. Once we like the landscape, we're gonna tell it to drive ahead so many meters and then wait. And then you had, of course, the very long transit time between the two, uh, the delay. So it was very tedious to get them to drive. Um, now I think the, the new rovers have a little bit more autonomy 
that they can start giving it goals, but still not full autonomy in the sense that it can just go ahead and do what it wants. Um, it's still getting direction and there still is that very long lag between them. So in fact, that's we're... ingenuity. The helicopter was mm -hmm. um, eventually deployed to do just that, to scout out for the rover. Yes. To go yes. Ahead. So, so you, you can put more and more things like that where yeah, it, it had to do a lot of the decisions of like, where's the safest place to land and everything else. So those were things that they could not, all they could do in the mission is say, here's the mission plan, now execute it. Um, and that's what a lot of the other robotic explorers that we had, you know, Pioneer, Voyager, and, and others is that they, um, they were having to do some things on their own. But again, they were getting commands from Earth on what it was to be set up. If we start talking about robots that are doing, let's say, real work, they're just not kind of exploring a little bit here and we take a look and review what they're doing. They have some pretty big goal. You know, it could be a construction project or something like that. They need to be able to uh, operate independent. And, and that's when you need to have a really good artificial intelligence that's able to make the decision. So you give it the goal, you know, dig a, a ditch over there and yeah. it's got to figure out what's the best way. And it runs into any sort of obstacles. It has to figure out what the, that solution is going to be. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you're eventually going to have to replace the ISS um, in a few years time, and that would involve building a new space station. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, there's, there's a great case to be made uh, for robots like Optimus to be used uh, for that particular use case. Um, you could even train them on Earth using imitation learning. Um, you could also teleoperate them if need be to an extent. But I think a lot of those um, procedural problems could be and training could be taken care of here on Earth itself. And then you just send them up and then it's kind of like a like a Lego set that you put together. I will say yes. that the uh, space stations that are in you know, design development phases right now um, that will replace uh, ISS. It, I, I believe that all of the designs um, involve a lot less manual assembly than the ISS required. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the Chinese uh, station. Sure. Yeah. It was just like dock. Case in point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if you look at the EVA that's going on here, it's rather interesting. You'll see that the legs are of absolutely no value the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's, it's so they're they're not really serving any sort of purpose. The asset, I don't know if you know, they're just kind of dangling out there. I don't see them ever yeah. pushing it off, off anything else. You you can probably kind of use them like a tail to you know balance yourself and orient. You know, just like wiggle them to just five arms should do, as long as it's tethered. <laughs> right. Yeah, you could have an arm just just dedicated to just snapping the bot on to whatever hold it needs on the outside of the ISS as it moves along. Cool. And it, you can even have a teleoperator from within. Absolutely. Easily. And oh, that's how the um, the robotic arms are done anyways. Those those big the Canada arm, Canadian yeah. arms that are moving around, those, those are all, mm. yeah, teleoperated. Let's talk about another interesting thing that, um, thanks to Elon, our lives are so in interesting. But <laughs> at the ISC in, um, in Baku last year, Elon uh, was asked about the potential of, uh, well, he sent a road, his roadster up, uh, which is right now in space orbiting the Earth and, and Mars. So he was asked, why not build a rover? And if the Cybertruck could uh, perhaps be a rover for the moon, then this is what he said. Let's do it. Put a Tesla in space. This was like an amazing uh, thing to see a Tesla actually flying into space. So you've already put, yeah. put one of the vehicles in space. Are you thinking about yeah. making a Tesla rover? Uh, maybe moon or mars uh any any ideas for a uh, cyber truck on the moon it would look cool that's for sure um the nice thing the nice thing about electric cars is that obviously do not require oxygen to uh they're not combustion cars so they don't they don't require they don't have to ingest oxygen from the uh, ambient atmosphere um so um yeah i think you know tesla could easily make a car that uh you know like a cyber truck Lunar variant, <laughs> just get, get the get the moon option package. You can get the moon option package with the Cybertruck variant. Wouldn't that be cool? Yes, it would. And of course, the original lunar rover was electric, also. Yeah. So, uh, for for that very same reason, couldn't be internal combustion. The tires, I think, were like woven titanium mesh or something like that, um, because it, again, you, you can't exactly inflate tires on the moon. Yeah. Um, and uh, the rubber probably well, get torn to shreds pretty quickly. I mean, you could inflate tires if you have a. You could, a, yeah. It's just that air source. But it's, it's, just, it's the source. Yeah, it, they. 
it's yeah. a point of failure that, that you don't yeah. need. And the and Chris, they're trying to come up with um, airless tires here on Earth. You know, I, yeah. I know Tesla's been working mm. with others. That it's the dream of everyone to have tires. You know have to, to actually put air in so yeah. the um and and of course the other thing is i think the the titanium mesh was was very light so everything is about making sure everything is as light as possible it's as durable as possible you have the um electric propulsion that was in there which which absolutely made sense and i'm not sure what batteries they were using at that time for apollo whether they were also using the same kind of hydrogen nitride battery or or something else but even might have been in those active, days i'm not sure yeah it might yeah it could have been even then, they get pretty decent range. Oh man, the iron crossfade. Yeah, see, so yeah, yeah. The lead acid. I kind of wondered, it, man. It's, it, it's the lead and the lead acid battery that bothers me. It's like it's heavy. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. you're talking about mass. The um, so we we know it can be done. Um, it does raise you know interesting questions. When you look at the rover, do you really need to have it enclosed or not? So if you're going to have a cyber truck on the moon, does it need to just be a buggy? Does it really need to be enclosed? Uh, the you know, only reason you would do that is because you want a shirt sleeve environment. But uh, if the idea is going getting in and out, you're going to have to be wearing your spacesuit. So it's a lot easier to be able to get in and out of something like this. That's a spacesuit. Uh, the so there, I think there'd be a lot of vari variations on there. And the question is whether the Cybertruck stainless steel is like the ideal body that you would want to have or, or material for being on the moon. And, yeah. So the uh, the shape of the vehicle is not really optimized for being a Mm -hmm. uh, pressurized cabin and the doors yep. are also not uh, ideal for for ha having an air seal uh, but i think that there's another use case for an unpressurized rover uh that is, that has that external skin which is that i mean this is something that the uh, that the apollo astronauts really struggled with um is all that lunar dust that's being you know kicked off by the tires just get, getting everywhere um so just protection from that, I think, would be mm -hmm. really valuable. And as far as mass goes, I mean, that's that's the beauty of having something that could land 30 tons, 100 tons uh, on the lunar surface and just drop one of these Cybertrucks on. It's just, it's just it doesn't make much of a difference. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a three ton vehicle, right? Or two and a half tons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and speaking of austere environments, I mean, I think there's a lot of visual signposting going on in this video that Tesla brought out a few weeks back. I mean, if you look at the beginning, uh, all of the, look at these locations. I mean, it's it just could be on the Mar uh, on Mars or on the Moon. Yeah, for all, yeah, right, for all you right can. You know, and you, yeah. yeah, and and Ozan brings up a, a really good point that the Cybertruck was designed for a low coefficient of drag. It's not yeah. a problem on the Moon, so. Yeah. You know, yeah, so you can come up with any shape that's ideal. And, sure. you know, I, I imagine almost the ideal kind of enclosure would be some sort of kind of bubble that it would go around, you know, just it, it could be very light. But I agree, you know, part of the idea is to um, to make sure you're not exposed to regolith or anything like that. Um, okay. I was going to say, a, in addition to that, you know, the, the aero dynamics is useless. It's the, you know, the flat surfaces. Uh, are not good for that pressure differential if you want a one bar atmosphere inside and you have vacuum inside it's just it, it wants that bubble shape um, that scott was saying yeah and i think that's what you usually would always see in those those 50s and 60s sort of science fiction showing what these rovers look like they always bubble out for exact that reason is because yeah. it's much better for the pressure and i mean it's just also cool if it's like this is kind of this glass sphere and the question is like how structural does that need to be because you're not going to yeah. be barreling along at 70 miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be going sure. at reasonable rates. And and then, um, so it could be something pretty light. Yeah. Uh, it just has to be, you know, if it, and the question is, does it have to, if it needs to be pressurized, then it's going to be strong enough for that. But if it doesn't need to be pressurized, if the whole idea is just to protect you from all the regolith that's going to be getting kind of kicked up as you're driving around, especially if it's like one rover is following another rover. <laughs> Yeah. The one in front okay. is probably going to be throwing a lot up. So, um, there, yeah, there could be I two mean, reasons for doing that. When it comes to toughness of vehicles, I doubt you'll get tougher than the Cybertruck to protect mm. you from all that uh, abrasive regolith. Um, That's true. But it, it's interesting. I mean, I just I was thinking about the, the truck bed and, and the fact that it's Tesla's designed in such a way that it there's a cover that rolls over it. There's, there's a lot of space to carry scientific equipment, maintenance equipment, even life life supporting life saving mm -hmm. equipment. If you had uh, FSD on the moon, uh, you could just have a couple of 
bots hanging out in the in in, in the truck being driven around from point A to point B. It Absolutely. wouldn't take much, would it? No, yeah. no, not much. And and again, you're probably more like a, a variant of the cyber cyber van or something like that. Is probably mm-hmm. what you would end up seeing on the moon because you know that that'll be the version that's let's say less aerodynamic, maybe more roomy, easier to get in and out. Um, a lot of people have asked about, oh, can't Optimus just get in and, and drive the Cybertruck? I'm like, well, you know, Optimus isn't very flexible. I think it would be really hard for Optimus to attempt to actually. But does Optimus need to drive the truck? With no, no, FSD? no. But but the point I'm making is like an astronaut wearing a suit. It's almost like yeah. Optimus trying to get in one of these things. So of it course, would have yeah. to be redesigned to make it very easy for uh, ingress and egress. Absolutely. It would be it would be a really cool visual though if they had an unmodified yeah. Cybertruck with an Optimus in the driver's seat, just land that thing and then have the Optimus drive you know, you know have have the Cybertruck drive Optimus around a little bit and then Optimus get out. Let's start a campaign. That would be an let's, amazing. Let's get Elon well. to do this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's when you say, "Oh, it, the future has arrived." Yeah, yeah, when when you see that soon, it's like that's it. You've got you've got Optimus, you've got the Cybertruck, you've got two yeah. of the main ingredients, you've got FSD. Which is the third? I got Starship. You know, it's just oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this year is going to be really, really important for Starship, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we'll look at that um, in a subsequent discussion. But I just wanted to add this. Um, this is uh, Icon has been awarded a NASA contract to explore lunar surface construction using regolith. Um, and if you look at these pictures, there's there's a, a Starship right there. In the background, yeah. and uh, this could so easily be Optimus and a cyber truck as well. Because if you're going to build on the moon, you need labor, you need trucks to haul your stuff around. Yeah. Perfect use case, wouldn't you say? So there's a lot of room for collaboration. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And when you think of the infrastructure that's required to deploy a crew of workers anywhere, it's incredible. You know, the the, the crew is just really the tip of the spear. And there's so much else that goes on there. All the logistics and everything else has to go on there. Um, you know, they always talked about an army marches on its belly. That's one of the things that Napoleon discovered is that, you know, a well-fed army is is a good army. And it's the same thing is that you're going into space. You have all these consumables you have to drag along with you. So, you know, not just the, 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 the air that you need to breathe, but also the water you need to drink and all the food and everything else. And a lot of times, that infrastructure requires other people that are just there to maintain that. They aren't actually the ones doing the work. Exactly. So if you just go down that pyramid, it gets pretty bad. Once you start yeah. deploying the bots to do it, all that goes away. And yeah. so if you were to, I think Starship, and this, this is like a point of discussion. It, it may be it's, it, you can send 100 people to Mars or possibly 1,000 or something like that. I, I know there's different configurations people have talked about. But mm. whatever that number is, you can probably multiply that by at least a factor of 10 if you are sending the bots instead bots, because the right. bots don't need to breathe. They don't need to eat. They don't need sanitation. Yeah. They don't need a whole lot of space. They, you know, they keep on talking about that. Whenever we wanted to, to go in space, we need to have some sort of uh, hibernation. Well, it's really easy to hibernate the bot. <laughs> you know? yeah. So you don't have to worry about that. So you can send the, the force multiplier there is incredible because not only can we yeah. send a greater number there, but when it's there, we don't have all this infrastructure that's required to really maintain them if they were people. So for these yeah. construction projects to work, yes, I think you want a, a team of bots doing most of it with astronauts that are really there to be the foreman and to be kind of supervising everything to make sure everything is going all right. Of course, at the end of the day, we want them to build these colonies so humans can come there and actually enjoy it and see it in person rather than in VR. Yeah, absolutely. And let's not forget, Construction sites on Earth are notorious for accidents. Mm-hmm. You don't want an accident happening up on Mars. Um, it, you'd rather lose a bot than a human, mm-hmm. right? Any day, and the, it's just, it's just the moment you have a mishap in space, um, the sort of neg- negative publicity that just grows around that is is um, very restrictive uh, for the evolution of any space program. So the last thing you want is uh, is to have a human casualty on the moon or on Mars. Absolutely. So I just want to play out this video. It's interesting that um, this is the SpaceX uh, animation of uh, arrival on Mars, and uh, it's it's really interesting. Well, I don't know if it was a conscious decision, but you don't see any any humans walking around. Mm. 
until you know you have starships land and then you have humans inside uh, that open the door and and look out onto everything that's already constructed and mm -hmm. it's just a wild guess but i suppose you never know with uh, with uh, elon's companies and his teams there are so many easter eggs always um you know waiting to be discovered you don't yeah. you don't have humans building any of that stuff you just have them arriving opening a door and uh, looking out. So, you know, one of the big question marks for me with uh, SpaceX's plans for Martian settlement was that they, they've always talked about, you know, in-situ research utilization, generating uh, local propellant uh, to refuel Starship uh, for, the, uh, for the ride home and using lunar ice for that. And that's, you know, that's a process that requires a lot of infrastructure setup. To you know, you, you got you got to land somewhere that has access to ice, and then you have to get you have to extract that ice, you have to melt that ice, you have to purify that. It, 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 well, I mean, you have to at least filter that ice. You know, it's gonna it's gonna have dust and dirt mixed into it, and then um, you, know, you know, use electrolysis to separate it, hydrogen and oxygen, and then use the subatomic reaction, combine it with with the atmosphere, and then you have to cryocool that that whole thing and pump it into these starships, and that's you know all of that is. I mean, that's like an industry on Earth, right? Well, oh, absolutely. And absolutely. the question in my mind was, you know, how are they going to set that up without people on the ground? And mm. um, and I, I, I was thinking, you know, for early crewed missions, uh, it might make more sense to bring the propellant with you. And I'd, I'd run some uh, some numbers on how to do that in such a way that you don't you don't actually even need to ref, refill uh, Starship on the surface. You can kind of refill it, refill in orbit, and land with enough propellant to get back. Um, so a way to get crew onto the surface using Starship, such that they could then take those components and assemble it and set up a base that could uh, enable more efficient mm -hmm. transit. But this would dramatically simplify that. If you could send robots to do that work for you. Even if they were teleoperated from, say, Mars orbit, that's something where mm. it's easier to get to Mars orbit and back uh, substantially. I mean, it does pose yeah. some additional challenges in terms of radiation exposure and and uh, the greater ex longer exposure to microgravity. But those are they, they are uh, relatively easy solutions for that at yeah. start scale as well so that might that might be a route to go down yeah i mean to yeah. be honest when i when i read this news uh, about uh, the lunar south pole oxygen pipeline and plans for it i said like, there's no way you could have human astronauts out there it's just it's just it's not practical it's just not logical you this is a perfect use case to deploy bots i mean it's not necessary that you have humanoid bots but bots of other forms when it comes to developing infrastructure in space, either in orbit or on the moon or Mars, do you see a route for Tesla to explore bots other than Optimus? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely see that. And I think the other thing I agree a, a lot with what Ozan said is that if you're looking for some of these resources, the uh, Zubrin's original plan with the in situ was like, he's just taking it out of the air. Well, the air, right there at Mars. It doesn't matter where you land, you can just suck it in and you're okay. And um, however, he did have a problem with the supply of hydrogen. So at that time, it wasn't clear whether there was water ice available on Mars. So they were schlepping the hydrogen from Earth and then processing that into to methane and uh, to get the uh, also the, the water that you would need. Um, and the only other thing they needed was the energy source. So they had a, a small nuclear reactor that would just be easily deposited wherever it had to be. So that was a pretty straightforward, easy infrastructure to set up. But once you start saying, oh, we're going to get ice, and it's like, well, are you landing like right next to a lake that you can just go ahead and throw a hose in there and suck everything up? It's like, no, it's like, it's you're probably landing somewhere where you think there's subterranean ice, and now you've got to do something to get down to get it. So it's like, oh, already we're going to yeah. have to start drilling or doing something like that. And we've already seen what happened <laughs> With the rover on Mars, that, that it turned out it's a lot harder than they thought to be able to drill into some of those rocks. So if you're trying to do something to, of that scale, it gets pretty tough. Then I agree, all, you know, it's the water is not going to be pure coming up. There's going to be everything else you have to do with it. All these other chemical processes, I suppose, potentially, 
you know, some of the infrastructure that you're just kind of dropping in there and it almost like Legos plugs together, but there's still going to be that aspect where you're out prospecting and trying to find the thing you're tapping into. And that's, that's going to be challenging for people to do it, just like the pipeline you're talking about. So it may be you think of designing a pipeline very differently than you do on earth, where you're expecting that you're going to have a lot of workers that are out there, you know, all these roughnecks that are just going to be out there bringing these things in there and bolting them together and, and busting their knuckles all the time as they're just taking the yeah. wrenches and moving all that around. And a lot of yeah. times it's done that way because that's like the cheapest way to be able to build it. But now you would be thinking a little bit differently. It's like, okay, how do we come up with something that we can deploy over this area that's very rugged where we can do it almost autonomously. And a lot of these things that we've done autonomously, yeah, maybe they involve a humanoid bot or they involve some other form of specialized automation that's able to do the job really well. Because all I'm thinking is that if Optimus is out there, it's because we have different sections of pipe that we have to fit together for some reason. But there could be a completely different way that the pipes are put together that could be done with some other kind of agent where it's able to go in and maybe do internal welding as opposed to having to take um, you know, nuts and bolts and wrenches and everything and try to tie them down. So there, there would be other ways of thinking of the pipeline problem different than what we're used to thinking of here on earth, because the, let's say the incentives and what, what the costs are, are very different than what you have here on earth. So oh, again, sure. the cyber track is going to look different because it's a very different environment. And you're also going to do different things that may uh, make it least costly. Whereas if you took that same decision on earth, you would say, well, that's the more expensive option. Why are you doing that? I mean, the nice thing about the humanoid form is that it's much easier to translate from, well, we know how to build things with humans to now we mimic that with robots, uh, that you don't have to invent a whole new way of, of assembling or manufacturing or, or prospecting. Uh, so that's something where right, exactly. we, might, we might see more Optimus use both on Earth and off world than we might otherwise expect for efficiency reasons, just because of that, right. that ease of translation. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and that, that's approach. key. Yeah, because what it means is that yeah, it's you can very easily replace one with the other. Mm -hmm. So if the bot is down, a human can go in and do it, and vice versa, because the tooling is compatible. Industrial right. robots, the end of arm tooling is not compatible with any human, and vice versa. Also, it's interesting at that same uh, event in Baku, um, Elon was asked about the possibility of Starship being used as um, as an outpost in space uh, mm -hmm. for scientific research. And perhaps as a, as a smaller version of a state of a space station, um, and Elon seemed to feel that it was very within the realm of possibility. Well, th there's a there's precedence for that already. It was called Skylab, yeah. right? You know, it's just like the, the the upper stage of the Saturn V and turned it into a space station. So yeah, if, if yeah, you that's, a, that's an even bigger transformation. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. still, it's the same thing is is that you you've got some. Thing that you already know how to get into orbit and all yeah. you have to do is, is just repurpose it or reconfigure it a little bit for that particular situation so yeah i, I think it would be absolutely perfect that it, it is sort of silly that what we're doing right now with the space station is yeah. it, it was built because it had to fit inside of something else and so right. everyone else is thinking the future what we want to do is we want to you know stick these things in a fairing and everything else and it's like well, why not just make the thing that goes up there the fairing to begin with? It's all the same mass. And then rather than bring it at home, you just decide to leave it up there. And then that means you could throw a lot more mass up there because you could get rid of um, the aerolons on there. You can get rid of all the heat tiling. I mean, there's so much stuff that you don't need um, because you don't plan on bringing it back home. And then maybe you figure out something like with the, the extra raptors on there. I guess you kind of needed to get up into orbit, but you never, you know, they could come up with some version. You just drop the skirt off or something like that and retrieve it some other way. <laughs> I mean, or, you even need to retrieve it, right? Something, yeah. something uh, like a, a crude have of that scale, just the development cost alone is crazy. Pretty substantial. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I won't make up numbers because, you know, we have, we have numbers for the ISS and we have numbers for, for Starship, but it's just like, there's a wide range. But it's, it's a and, very large number, and and, and did, didn't Elon there, also mention somewhere that the 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 um, effective space of the ISS was very close to a, a starship? Yeah, could be, could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's they're both you know on the order of a thousand cubic meters of of uh, volume, and it, you know there's there's some 
wiggle room in that um, HLS is going to have a less pressurized volume because uh, there's, it's going to have that unpressurized deck, but you could use more of that space for a pressurized volume. Uh, and then, you, uh, you know, there, there are uh, suggestions about stretching the, uh, that have, uh, I mean, stretching Starship, right? Uh, right, partly, right. For design, partly for a longer fairing. So you could, I mean, you could realistically go up to 1500 uh, cubic meters without increasing the diameter yeah. or uh, doing anything crazy with the shape or, or uh, reducing uh, the propellant mass, which you can also do. You could reduce the propellant uh, mass to uh, maximize that you know, volume mass. Yeah, rate. I believe that was, you that was the need. solution he was looking at. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you could go up to 2000 cubic meters or, or more, uh, yeah. which would be larger than the, than the ISS. Uh, answers, yeah. And I think that going back to the Raptors, if they're producing those at somewhere on the order of a million dollars a piece, especially if they have already, and, and then if, if they're, uh, if they're pre-flown Raptors, I mean, what's the, what's the cost of mm -hmm. exactly just yeah. leaving those on? Yeah. And, and, and again, use that's, them that's... as a, M mod shielding on the yeah, I mean that that, the back that, of it to, that was something that we we had talked about before also that whenever you have so these expendable versions of, of Falcon Heavy or stuff like that, you just find those Merlin engines that are sort of towards the end of life anyway, and put them on there. So you you're never really throwing away anything that's new. So they've already had a lot of utility. Yeah, that makes sense, and I'm sure the cost of trying to retrieve those things then is just not going to be worth the manufacturing cost, right? Yeah. At that point. And you never know. It could be that, you know, some couple of decades in the future, someone finds some like need for that thing to be able to, oh, good thing we have these engines. Now we can just blast ourselves on, on the way to, to Mars or somewhere else, you know, the Volgons are coming. I'll just cobble something together for a rescue mission. Yeah. yeah. Certainly the main tanks and, and RCS, you, you can still use those, like the refueling, because ISS needs reboost and, and maneuvering, right, capabilities mm -hmm. and that's something where you would have that built in with, uh, at the very least, RCS, even if you didn't want to turn the Raptors exactly. on. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. I, I I have to ask you this question. You know, there's been so much talk about um, retiring the ISS. Um, there's just, do you deorbit it, let it burn up? Um, and then there's also the counter argument of why not just take it to a Lagrange point and just let it hang out there as a testament to our you know, our, our, our spirit of endeavor and just as a testament to the achievement of our race. Where, where do you guys stand on it? I hate to see it. Personally, I'd hate to see it burn up in the, you know. I think that um, I'm okay with ditching it. I think if we're going to preserve it, I would prefer to bring it to Earth and this, in pieces and put it in a museum. Um, I think that moving it to a higher orbit it runs the risk of generating a lot of debris as that falls apart over time. It, it would be, you know, we, we have this, this plastic outside rug that, that we bought some years ago. And, you know, in the sun, it has basically started flaking off and, and it's just like breaking up into these tiny fragments. And, and that pains me to think of the amount of, you know, earth destroying waste that, that's being generated by that. And while space is large and you know you don't have biology out there, a orbital debris is a real problem. And if you have chunks breaking off of the ISS or you have some some tank blows up and and you have a bunch of little pieces or something hits it and it's just like falls apart into uh, you know thousands of pieces. Yeah, or, but or space just, is also phenomenally big. It is, a but space you're still space. we're still talking about putting it somewhere in the Earth. Moon space, like Earth Moon uh, system, right? So yeah. the, the chunks that will fall off of that, if, especially if you put it in, in a Lagrange point between uh, the Earth and Moon, right? Right. And they will tend to, a lot of them will tend to end up in either lunar orbit or Earth orbit. And I mean, lunar orbit is even more susceptible than Earth orbit because it doesn't, you know, you don't have uh, that atmosphere to. Uh, gradually deorbit right. things. I mean, there's you, you yeah. still have the gravitational perturbances to deorbit things, but it's, ah, I just I just wouldn't want to, I, I would hate for the ISS to become <clears throat> uh, just a, a, a source of trash. 
there's and there's a lot of junk on there yeah i mean you're just looking at that it it just looked like things that could start flying uh it's good that you kind of went first ozon because um yeah maybe it kind of commit i i was hoping it'd be something we'd try our best to preserve it for the, the the generation that could really do something with it whether it turns it into a museum in orbit that people can go to they put a big bubble around it or something like that or whether they figure out how to then bring it down piece by piece as necessary as the technology is there. Um, the problem is that the time in between, you know, it's like, it does pain me this idea that we're just going to throw it somewhere in the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean or the most remote part of the, of the Pacific Ocean, never to be seen because we have so many historical relics in space that we've never been able to bring back. You know, Sputnik burned up decades ago and so we only have replicas in museums and the the only authentic pieces of rockets and stuff we have are ones that never flew at least until spacex you know you go to nasa and it says well that one actually flew but the ones in the rocket garden no they just they built it but it never had a chance to go so um you know we we do have those like uh you know f1 engines that uh bezos fished out of the Right. So he he, got, yeah. he, got, he was able to get a few things, but not the full Saturn V. And the Saturn V yeah. that are on display are, again, the ones that they didn't get to fly. Yeah. So, I mean, like part of it is like, oh, they should just make it part of like an O'Neill cylinder someday. You know, yeah. that's just kind of in there that even go and take a look. Uh, and yeah. the only way you can do it is to make sure it's there for that next generation as opposed to just like up disposing it. So that's yeah. my initial reaction. I'd love to see something like that. But uh, we could condemn that generation from ever being able to do that if low Earth orbit is full of space junk because mm. the ISS just kind of slowly broke apart. But it needs to be, be maintained. I mean, it, I agree. It's just, just because it's uninhabited doesn't mean chunks won't start falling off. They may actually start yeah. falling off more rapidly than when they're there, just kind of service it and make sure everything is okay. So that could become a potential danger. Yeah, yeah. I know yeah. it's like... I'd be, you, I'd be more okay with sending it out into interplanetary space for some you know and it's yeah it's by every that. once in a while you know we have we have <laughs> yeah but the, the question is how risky would that be i mean you think you're trying to boost that whole thing that's going to be a lot of delta v and what happens if it breaks apart on the way you're well, probably more propulsion. likely so so if you were going to preserve it i would just say do whatever you have to do to keep it boosted in, in low earth orbit for as long as you can and that if something looks catastrophic, that you figure out how to deorbit it right away. But I understand why the administrators, everyone's think like, yeah, it's going to be too costly to maintain. There's better replacements coming along, and it's a danger sitting out there. Yeah. You, you could you could tow it out with a, a fleet of, of basically Starlink sets uh, with extra extra argon and, nice. and a long okay. tether, and just kind of gently long... gently. Uh, but I, I, but I'm just see this. This is where I'm kind of concerned because we're going to be transiting a lot of orbits to get out there. It's going to take oh, a long yeah. time, and this thing yeah, yeah, has yeah. like so it's so much surface area on there that the chances of being able to do that without some satellite or piece of orbital debris hitting it, I would be a bit nervous about that. I, you know, I don't know what to calculate. Yeah. My gut tells me, well, it's a low probability. It's definitely not zero. And it might be that it's like, oh, it's like, it's not one in a billion. It's like maybe one in a thousand or one in a hundred, which is like, yeah, too risky. I hear you. I mean, the thing is that it would not take all that much to, like the pressurized modules, those would easily fit in a, in the proposed Starship fairing, the chomper. Um, So if you were able to detach and that's something where Optimus might come in handy. You know, you don't necessarily mm-hmm. want to, to do that. astronauts for that, but uh, to... <laughs> <laughs> to do that. So, so yeah, that'll it'll look like something out of 007, where it comes up and just shh, like that, grabs a piece of the International Space Station and brings it down. Because, <laughs> and, and, and that's <laughs> the other concern is is they're thinking of bringing it, it down in pieces, anyways, right? Deorbiting it in pieces. Oh, I thought they I were going to the, the whole thing. Oh, they were Ready? just going to push. Through. Okay, the whole thing. So. Uh, I mean, I might not have uh, kept up with it, but yeah. I yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure because I, I think there's a certain amount of risk in like tearing the, the modules apart. Yeah. You know, when you do that, you could also have a lot of things go wrong. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but because, yeah, because that thing's, huh, 
It's going to come yeah. down in one big piece. I mean, it's not not much of it's going to burn up. There's there's going to be so much there. A lot of it's it, it'll it'll, it'll break, break up into a bunch of it'll uh, break up, but it's going to come down in some pretty big pieces. And uh, yeah, you got you got to make sure they hit the target area right. That's going to be quite a big splash <laughs> and quite a sight. I mean, it's like it'll be a meteor it, shower. Oh yeah, you don't want, but, but, the, but the, it, it also it also be a huge media event. I mean, it, oh, I mean yeah. think about how the, the people want to go see a. Um, yeah, when, when they want to see the solar eclipse or something like that, you know, people flock to where that is. If you know the day this thing is going to come down, there are going to be people that are going to want to go to wherever is going to be the best vantage point. <laughs> yeah. Whether it's New Zealand or, or Australia somewhere or, you know, some remote island in, in the Marshall Islands, you know, somewhere out there. Um, or, you know, who knows how many people are going to charter a boat <laughs> to get as close as possible to where it comes down, because that's going to be quite the light show. Yeah, you don't want this happening. You don't want uh, yeah. the Chinese rocket booster happening. Yeah. Uh, that was quite uh, something. Yeah. See, that's amazing that, okay, so that was just the, the booster. That wasn't coming out of orbit, correct? That was, right. I think, just no, the first just stage booster. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So at, at that point, um, yeah, they're not going to burn up. They're going to hit the ground with a lot of force. And what I'm, I'm surprised is when they go over there, how much of it is still intact? Yeah. Yeah. In in those cases, it's like you think there'd be nothing left. It's like, oh, yeah, you recognize it. Lots of the pieces here. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I personally, I, I would hope that at least some part of the ISS could be preserved in space. I mean, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you're looking at space tourism being a big thing in the next few decades. I'm sure there'll be a whole lot of people who pay good money to go and uh, just go and visit the space station or some part of it. Maybe the cupola and uh, mm -hmm. get into the cupola and gaze out and get that experience it, it'll be a, gr a great shot for instagram and let's let's not forget that um this entire program and the iss is a testament to global cooperation even during the peak of the cold war so there's i mean it it, it just might be a bunch of metal and stuff up there but it the significance mm -hmm. uh, is huge it's just historic and i i would hate to see all of it go yeah, it's like what? What do we think? Was it? Uh, I remember historically, was it um, the Romans or Cleopatra's army that basically decided they had to burn the uh, Library of Alexandria? Mm. You know, because yeah. it was of strategic importance on that particular day for their survival. Yet, the cultural heritage that was lost there—I mean, it's like, huh. you know—and and it's almost the same thing. This, this is kind of like the the Library of Alexandria, in a way, like you yeah. say, it was the, uh, a huge testament of what, not what the Americans could do, but what the human species could do, because it yes. was an international exactly. project. It's showing the cooperation, that incredible symbol of the ingenuity and uh, the desire for, comp not for competition, but for cooperation. So in many ways, yeah, if you, you lose that. Um, and it's still, it's something you can see in the night sky. Yeah, you know, it, I, I I see it occasionally. I'm like, what's that bright thing? And I look it up. It's like, sure enough, the ISS just went by and wasn't aware of that. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, Dr. Walter, you and I are a lot more sentimental than Ozan Bayer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, it's it would be nice to preserve, but I I am thinking more about heartless. You are where heartless. Are we, <laughs> where are we headed? You know, <laughs> ultimately, it's hardware. Uh, it's I'm I'm really glad that it's well documented. The yeah. history of it, uh, all the all the work that went into it, the cooperation that that's that that it involved, all the the science that was done on it. Um, you know, it's it's great that we have this kind of footage that we don't have for a lot of things that were lost in the past. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think the only thing about that is if we did bring it down and brought down different modules, whether the different modules that go to the different countries of origin, right. or they go to one right. place, and that there oh, how much would be more contentious than anything else. You know, it's like, yeah. no, it's going to go to the Smithsonian in, in, uh, in, in Washington <laughs> or something like that. And people are like, no, no, we don't want it to go there. You know, it's like, yeah. So unfortunately, if it does come back down, it'll probably be broken apart and uh, yeah. all the, the pieces will, will go somewhere else. Yeah. But, but there are, you know, there are tours to see the Titanic. We know it didn't turn out so well that, that summer, yeah, but you know, <laughs> there are people who can actually go down and view the Titanic. And yep. you know, if it ends up at some spot in the Pacific Ocean, I'm sure some future generation will figure a way 
to go down and view it and maybe collect yeah. it. So maybe it's not completely lost. Thank you so much, uh, both uh, Dr. Walter and uh, Ozan. I'm just going to pull up your um, Twitter profiles. That's Going Ballistic 5. That's uh, where you can find Dr. Walter on X. I keep saying Twitter, but it's X. And uh, you also have uh, Ozan at Billick Ozan. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been such a pleasure Thank talking you. to you about so many things. We got to yeah. do this more Likewise. often. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be great. And we, yeah, we get we get the the, the next uh, Starship launch to talk about. That's going to be coming. Oh up. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So that's, that's on the agenda. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Thank you too.